Hi there, thank you so much for tuning in to Around the World in 80 Oysters, a live show about international oyster cuisine, uh, culture, and appreciation. I'm Julie Chu, I'm the founder of In a Half Shell, your guide to the world's most exceptional oysters, producers, and destinations. So thanks so much for tuning in again, and today we are revisiting Australia, but we'll be paying special attention to the Sydney rock oyster, which is a species that you actually can't get in the US, um, but it is native to Australia, and I believe also New Zealand. So today I have, my guest is John Sussman, who is the founder of Appalachian Oysters and the owner of Fishtails, which is a seafood marketing agency. And he's also the head judge of the Sydney Royal Oyster or Sydney Royal Show Oyster Competition. So very excited to have John with me. I'm going to bring him on. Hey, John. Hey, Julie. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Fantastic. Fantastic. Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. You look very warm. <laughs> it's like 90 <laughs> degrees in New York City, but I understand it's quite the it's opposite. <laughs> bloody cold here. I'm based in Sydney at the Sydney Fish Market. And um, normally Sydney is, you know, we don't get really cold in winter, but we've had a bit of a cold snap and yeah, it's it's chilly. So the turtleneck gets the, its uh, one for year run. All right, you look like quite like the Steve Jobs of the seafood world. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Perfect. Well, before I forget, for everybody who is tuning in, you are so welcome and encouraged to ask questions using the comment section of either Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're tuning in. And then at the end of our conversation, I'll try and pick a few good ones to, to quiz uh, John about. So, all right. Well, let's get started. I mean, I've, I'm just so curious to know, like, tell me a little bit more about what you do. I, I know you do a lot in seafood, but specifically <laughs> uh, as it relates to oysters. Okay, so um, look, I've, I've been uh, lucky enough to be working across the seafood industry for the last 30 years, uh, everything from catching to cooking. Um, I actually started my life as a scallop diver in South Australia, um, which is in the sort of halfway between Sydney and Perth, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with our part of the world. Um, and in fact, uh, where I used to dive in Coffin Bay is one of the great uh, oyster producing regions of this country. Uh, it now produces predominantly the Pacific species, mm -hmm. but it is, it is home to a uh, naturally occurring indigenous flat oyster that we have as here in Australia as well. So. Um, as part of my life in seafood, I've been working in, in, uh, in the oyster category. And 21 years ago, I uh, was part of the, the foundation team that started the uh, Sydney Royal Show Aquaculture Competition, of which the, uh, the oysters are the, the, the marquee competition, if you will. So I've been actively involved in, um, in participating in, in judging oysters for the last 21 years. And uh, of course, you know, I can't go a day without eating oysters. So my life with oysters is, is pretty, pretty well immersed. <laughs> that's awesome. And very lucky to be able to eat oysters all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, speaking of Sydney and such, I'm going to actually pull up a screen and we're going to take a little bit of a virtual tour of where you are. Oh, cool. Just because I love giving a little geography lesson. Now, okay, so you're based here. I actually yep. still haven't made my way to Sydney yet, but hopefully that will. It's happen. an amazing city. It it really is. I mean, we have a very diverse culture. It's it's naturally very beautiful. We have this amazing, amazing harbour that is um, is just incredible. It just you know I I try and get out there every weekend, and it's just such a beautiful place to to be. It's uh, it's a geographically uh, beautiful city. And it's mm -hmm. um, it, it has this beautiful climate. We, as I said, we don't get really cold very often. Um, we get really warm in summer, but not not stinking hot. Not, and it's not it's sort of subtropical, so we don't have the stickiness of far north Queensland, um, and we don't have the the chill of of you know Melbourne or Tasmania, our southern southern mm. southern right. cities. Yeah. You know. So where, you know, is, is the Sydney Rock Oyster named after Sydney? Like, where does that name come from? Look, that's a really good question. I mean, it's, it, it's a colloquial name that's sort of basically been applied to this species of oyster for the last, um, you know, couple of hundred years yeah. since the early, early settlers here in, in, uh, in, our, in our part of the world. But it is actually a species that is endemic to our waters. It only grows along 1,200 kilometres of uh, coastline from the 
Victoria, uh, sorry, the Victorian border in a township called Mallacoota uh, to the Queensland border, which is, you know, the Tweed River. Uh-huh. And there is, a, there is a, you mentioned before, there is a similar species in New Zealand, but this species that we have here on in New South Wales is, is endemic to our waters. And, uh, and as such, it, it sort of became popularised in the early days, believe it or not, as a, as a um, for the use of the shells in lime production. So the early settlers actually dredged these oysters and, and, and gathered these oysters for the purposes of not actually the, the meat, but for the shell. Um, okay. And so it's, yeah, it's, it, it's kind of interesting in that, in that regard. Um, is it, so the other species that you speak of is the Angazi? The Angazi, that's right, which is okay. a lot of people mistakenly refer to it as the Bellon of Australia, but it actually isn't. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a close cousin, but it's, a, it's about as close as I am with, say, Kylie Minogue. So, um, you know. <laughs> Unexpected <laughs> reference, but, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, it's slightly different. Um, but okay. the, so the three, the three, predominant species that we have here in, in Australia that are, that are sold commercially is the rock oyster, yep. the Pacific oyster, and the Angazi oyster. Um, and, and this the, is the, the, the rock oyster that is shown right now. That's correct. So yeah. that, that map that you have up there, which shows the predominant estuaries um, that um, the Appalachian oyster farm uh, operate and, and draw, draw inventory from uh, are up and down that coastline. So if you can Imagine that map is, I think it's about actually 1,350 kilometres long. Wow. And there are, there are 60, 60, 60 estuaries in which the, the uh, rock oysters grow, ranging mm-hmm. from those up on the Queensland border, and, and that tends to be fed by, you know, the flush of the tropical rains and, and thunderstorms in what is our, our late summer, so January, February. Mm-hmm. And then the south coast, which is fed by the melting snow melts from the snowy mountains, which tends to be in, in our spring, which is sort of September, October. So we have, it's really fantastic because it means that we have pretty much 12 months supply of rock oysters as they come in and out of season up and down the coast. Uh, do people, um, I, I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but do, do people notice that like any changes in flavor as oh, look absolutely and look julie thanks to people like yourself and the, and you know the general interest in in oysters i think there's globally been a renaissance of appreciation or in some parts of the world an awakening of awareness for just how unique oysters are from the specific estuary that or waterway that they come and you know like it's less than half a generation ago the only difference people might in this part of the world might make between oysters was whether they were served rockefeller or Kilpatrick. Cool um, mm-hmm. Whereas now, of course, they're not only not only ordering by the species, but they're ordering by um, season and by region and by grower. So it's so exciting that we're seeing this, you know, real, you know, awakening of awareness and understanding for the, how different the nuances between estuaries. Yeah. And the rock oyster, in particular, tends to reflect. I mean, I know everyone talks about the mahua, but you know, the rock oyster, because of its physiology, really does reflect its mahua probably more than, than any other oyster because it is so unique. And it, it's very selective in the food that it takes in and it does therefore reflect that, um, you know, it's, in, it's micro environment. And that can even be within a single estuary. You can see the difference between the flavour and texture of an oyster that might be further up the estuary where there's more fresh water or closer to the closer to the the uh, the lake mouth or the river mouth and there's more oceanic flow that's interesting i actually didn't um i've not heard of oysters being more selective about their food is, mm. <laughs> so is it um i mean is it also slower growing it is. it is so okay. so you know the typical rock oyster um is sort of between 24 and 48 months to market um, I mean, there is contemporary technology and contemporary uh, husbandry practices that are now being applied by some of the you know, smart young growers. And it's really exciting to see a lot of the young uh, aquaculturists coming into the industry and applying new technologies and, and, uh, and new methodologies and husbandry techniques. And that's, that's really sort of shortening that life cycle a bit. But one of the beauties of the rock oyster is because it is slow growing, and you know, it, it really benefits from being intertidal as well, that it does take on um, this incredible depth of flavor 
that I'm convinced has something to do with it, it being slow growing. Sure. I, I would agree with that. I feel like the ones that take a little bit more time develop more complexity in the flavor. So it's not necessarily just one note, but layered, I would say. Yeah. So yeah. Um, from like just, I guess, a baseline species flavor profile, are there very distinct differences between the rock oyster baseline flavor to the Angazi to the, the Pacific? Oh, absolutely. Look, I think probably the biggest, for, for those that haven't had the opportunity to try a rock oyster, and regrettably, as you mentioned before, we can't export them into the US. There is um, a restriction on any bivalve mollusks from Australia to go into the US, which is just a silly government to government thing, but you know, it is what it is. So, so bad luck, fellas, you can't eat them in the US, but um, come down here and try some. The, I mean, I guess as a baseline um, descriptor, the thing that the virgin rock oyster consumer always sometimes always notes whether they get shocked or fall in love with um, is the mineralization we have a really incredibly strong mineralization characteristic as a baseline flavor note in, in a rock oyster you know like some people might reflect that it's like kicking uh, licking a copper pipe um, you know there are really heavy mineral traces of copper and zinc um, and the iodine notes even seem to be way more complex than in, uh, I find, particularly in, say, a, just a simple Pacific oyster, for example. So um, I like to describe to people the, the, the basic difference between a rock oyster and a Pacific oyster is the difference between a Sauvignon Blanc and a Chardonnay. Um, and, that, and, you know, there are beautiful Sauvignon Blancs and there are beautiful Chardonnays. And there's also pretty, there can be ordinary Sauvignon Blancs and ordinary Chardonnays as well. But, <laughs> but in terms of that, just sort of mouth filling, uh, really deep, rich, complex note, um, the, the rock oyster is, is really, I think, um, abundant in, the, in those okay. notes. The other, the other element that I find, and I've eaten, been lucky enough to eat the oysters all around the world, that I find in the rock oyster that I haven't found in too many other oysters anywhere is the umami that really lip-smacking, savoury characteristic that tends to come at the back of the palate. Um, and there is something about the rock oyster that just lingers in your mouth that is really, you know, really delicious. And it is the, it is the ultimate, I think, aperitif oyster because it gets those, you know, saliva glands really working hard. And so you're ready for dinner. You know, it's, it's <laughs> game on when you eat rock oysters. <laughs> Got it. That's such a good descriptor. Now, do you, uh, do you, well, speaking of the aperitif, like, do you find that most people do enjoy rock oysters as a starter versus, like, as part well, of I like the main? I like breakfast, actually, myself. Oh, mm. that's just not fair. <laughs> what time is it over there? Is it nine? It's nine, yeah, nine yeah. Nine in the morning? Okay. But it's Perfect. a late start on the oyster front. I normally sort of, here at the Sydney Fish Market, we have, like, not only a big wholesale, um, fishmonger community but we have you know five really big retailers as well so i like to uh do the rounds early and uh snap up a few oysters for brecky oh fantastic what, what did you mm. just eat right there well this is a whop and go this is from from uh the, from down on the south coast it's about 400 kilometers south of sydney this particular grower um is one of our consistent gold medal winners from the sydney royal show Ooh. Um, yeah and uh, i said Mate, you just happen to I'm, have some here i just happen to have some <laughs> Happen to have some here in the office, so wow, you know. Like, um, but yeah, so that's that's a really it's Wap and Go is a is a beautiful estuary down on the south coast. It's it's probably one of the most pristine waterways uh, on the east coast of Australia. It's surrounded by the Mimosa National Park. Um, it's stunningly beautiful. Uh, it's fed by tributaries that start way back up in the Snowy Mountains, um, and it's got a, a relatively shallow oceanic mouth so it doesn't get the same tidal flow that other estuaries get so that umami point that i was just talking about is really mm. prevalent i think it's probably of all of our all of our 60 estuaries it has the, the the greatest you know depth of you know fist to the jaw umami yeah well now go back to so it's a gold winner what does that mm -hmm. like how does that competition work Okay, so look, <laughs> winding back 21 years ago, there was a very famous wine judge by the name of Len Evans here in Australia, who effectively started the wine show judging system globally. Um, the Royal Agricultural Society, which is a, uh, a crusty old um, organisation that is full of, you know, blokes in tweed jackets with, you know, sort of club ties and a Cobra hat, um, wandering around checking the, the, the quality of the stud bulls, 
So every year the farmers would bring their stud bulls in and they'd be judged by their peers for the quality. And that, that judging actually became the benchmark of value for those animals. So it's a very important uh, industry body that it actually sets the agenda for excellence in agribusiness. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's existed for over 200 years since our early settlers as a means by which to have you know, peer judging against an independent criteria of the quality of the agribusiness, the agriculture that they're growing. Now it's yeah. extended out to you know everything from beef, cattle, and pork, and chickens, and and um, and uh, flour, and and wine, of course. And the wine show, which was which exploded back in the '60s, it became you know the global benchmark for for third party judging of of wine. And this guy Len Evans, who's a, a legend here in the wine industry in Australia he had this idea to start an aquaculture competition. And so with uh, a lady by the name of Lindy Milan, who was the chairwoman of the RAS, they assembled a group of, of uh, oyster stakeholders, such as myself, um, and that included everyone from chefs and journalists, but more importantly, growers, managers, scientists, um, wholesalers, processors, retailers, and um, we used the wine show judging system as the, as the basis against which we developed the criteria for the judging of the oysters. Now, it's quite interesting because we judge out of 100 points, which for those of you that are familiar with the wine show judging system is how they operate. And the concept is that every exhibit starts, it's, uh, it is viewed with the starting point that it is perfect. And we have a system that takes away what we uh, agreed and perceived faults and it's very objective. In fact, amongst the 18 judges, we have a panel of 18 judges and generally we have four or five associates every year to bring keep the judging pool uh, strong and deep. And between our 18 judges on any given competition, we have less than 5% variance in the blind assessment. Hmm. And we, we will be doing up to you know 80 or 90 exhibits in a day. So you know it's a pretty serious exercise. And certainly over the last 21 years, I've been proud to say that uh, to have been part of it. And we've seen how it's had an impact on the quality of the oysters that are being farmed because it's genuinely objective. We provide, we provide the growers with you know, genuine feedback. I mean, the, the concept is that we are, you know, we are judging as if we are consumers and what the consumer should expect to get out of an oyster. Mm -hmm. And these days, where in now better restaurants in Australia, you can be paying four, five, even six bucks a piece for an oyster. No. Um, you know, there is an obligation, I feel, for the industry to deliver excellence. I mean, at that, at that point on a dollar per pound basis, it's probably the most expensive protein in the restaurant. So, you know, you've got an obligation to deliver excellence if you're gonna charge that sort of money for, for an oyster. So the show really does have a, a really important role to play and has played a really important part of, the, of fostering excellence across the industry. And it's, it's just, it's so exciting. I'm, I'm more excited now than I was, you know, 21 years ago about the, the relevance of the show and how it actually has a genuine position in stewarding quality across the farming right. community. Yeah. And what, when, is, when does the show happen? Typically, we're in March, late February, March. Okay. Um, it, it, you know, which unfortunately this year it had to be cancelled at the last minute right. because of uh, that bloody Corona thing. Right. But uh, <laughs> doesn't that? Um, but like you know what? Some of, huh? Sorry, the thing about Corona has been. We were chatting uh, off air before. Is that it's been the the upside has been that because probably seventy percent of our oysters are sold through uh, through the food service sector, which has mm -hmm. been closed for 12, 14 weeks. Um, farmers have left their oysters in the water. So yeah. we, are, you know, in retail, the benefit is that you've got this amazing quality of winter crop coming through that is just exceptional, absolutely exceptional. I mean, look at, look at this, oh shit, look at the quality of this oyster. <laughs> oh, that's I mean, a beauty. It's, it's absolutely superb. Yeah, I might have to eat that one. <laughs> mm. Yeah, bloody delicious. Well, so yeah, so now your growers are kind of realizing that if they just leave them in the water alone for a little bit longer. Yeah, I mean, look, develop. I think generally that, uh, you know, as I, as I said before, we've seen this renaissance of, of awareness for appreciation of quality. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it look, it wasn't that long ago that I'd genuinely randomly walk up to an oyster farmer and say, listen, describe your oyster. And they'd say, well, it tastes like an oyster. And I'd be going, well, 
can you give me a little more insight? I mean, I'm looking around here. You've got a lot of vegetation. There doesn't seem to be a lot of, you know, many creeks or tributaries. You've got a big open oceanic mouth to the estuary. Is there a chance that this is probably going to be a little more saline than, say, an oyster that's growing in the lake down the road that doesn't have any water, uh, doesn't have an right. oceanic front right. edge? And, and they're going, yeah, I suppose so. And it's like, you know, well, what do you think about Harry's oysters from the lake? Well, they tend to be more vegetably. I'm going, yeah, okay, we're getting somewhere, you know. <laughs> <laughs> doing comparison oh, i was i was actually thinking about when the show when the contest happens is in march does that put some oysters at an advantage over others oh, look, look i guess it, it it does but i mean yeah. and you know to be really to be really brutal about it i mean we know that that the smart growers are preparing show pumpkins um yeah. as they do in the wine show as they do in the dairy show as they do in the beef cattle show we know that um, and so the savvy farmer that wants to, let's say, exploit, and I mean that lightly, I suppose, um, the competition will, you know, be manicuring a crop specific for the show. Mm -hmm. And so one of the good things about a rock oyster is you can actually manipulate its condition by where you position it in the estuary. So, you know, it tends to grow faster in slightly fresher water where there's more vegetal components mm -hmm. and by bringing it down the estuary to a more oceanic environment it actually slows the growth down so they can actually condition them up river and then bring them down towards the the the, the oceanic front of the of the estuary or the river and keep keep the oyster in great condition but slow its uh, sexual maturity right that's interesting and what kind of systems do they use to contain look them? okay so we've we've seen uh i guess probably the historic rock oyster farming was uh, a fairly provincial method of, originally it was just like they, because they just attached themselves to the substrate, they'd be on rocks, and hence the name the rock oyster, they'd be found on rocks. Um, the original farming was on slabs of concrete, so the farmers would just put a big slab of concrete in the estuary and the spat would catch on the, on the slab of concrete and they'd come back, you know, three years later and chip them off and, right. you know, th there you go, there's your crop. Then it moved to you know, sort of tar-covered sticks. So they'd set these platforms in the estuary with these tar-covered tomato stakes that would catch the spat, and the oysters would stay on those until literally, again, they were picked up and chipped off for, to go to market. These days, the predominant method or the more favoured methodology is to, use, is to use hanging baskets or swinging baskets or, or okay. drift bags so that the oyster is suspended as high in the water table as possible where the majority of the nutrients are in that first metre. Um, and they're easier to handle. They end up delivering a much more beautiful, consistent, beautiful cup, cupped shell with a, you know, and the, the rock oyster is, has, when it's in perfect condition like this one, has that beautiful triangular shape with a deep cup mm. and, a, and a tight lip. So that's, that's what the contemporary farmers are using the swinging basket technology for and there's a brand new technology called the flip farm which allows farmers to go through and tip their sacks over and uh, and allow them to be actually you know aerated for a period of time to reduce over catch and strengthen the adductor muddle um, adductor muscle which of course mm -hmm. increases the sweetness of the oyster so um, you know we're seeing this rapid rise in the use of technology which is really fantastic because there's this massive uplift in quality which is so exciting very cool. Is there, um, like, what percentage of the entire Australian oyster production is of the Sydney rock? Okay, so rock oysters account for a little over 45% of our production oh. here in Australia. The Pacific okay. oyster's only really been farmed here. Well, no, it's not, it, probably a touch less than that, to be honest. I mean, okay. although that's a, res, as a uh, right now, that is a result of, of POMS disease that hit our Pacific farms in, oh, sure. uh, mm -hmm. in Tasmania, which had a knock-on effect of restricting the amount of spat that could go to the South Australia. So that, the South Australian and Tasmanian farms are exclusively Pacific oysters, um, and they're very big operations. You know, they're multiple hectares, you know, like big, big operations. And they were hit really hard with POMS. Yeah. Rock oyster farming has typically been quite localised and quite provincial smaller farms often mum and dad you know one pump you know a couple of hectare lease you know it's not not doesn't have the big industrial production like the pacific oysters have historically had and the pacific oyster farming's really only been here 
since the sort of like early mid eighties. Um, so it's, it's a relatively new new industry here. Yeah. Do you see that um, there would be companies that would grow the Sydney Rock at a larger scale than right now? Well, that's ha that's happening right now, that's happening. and that's a really good thing. You know, a company that I'm involved with, Australia's Oyster Coast, they have um, you know we've set out to to buy and and develop farms in a number of estuaries and mm -hmm. that allows us to actually you know catch spat on the north coast condition it on the mid north coast bring it to the south coast to finish them so we we're allowed to have you know uh int inter estuary uh translocation and yeah. so the smart farmers are now recognizing that some estuaries are better for actually um, you know, producing spat and other estuaries are better for conditioning and other estuaries are better for finishing. So that's mm. one, again, one of the really exciting developments about, let's call it the industrialization of, of, of oyster farming. Sure. Um, and it, and big doesn't mean bad. Big means that you've got resources that you can throw to be specialists at things. You know? Sure. And with all yeah. this production is, um, most of it's consumed in the country or does a lot of it get exported? I mean, not in the US, but I remember going to like Jakarta and having my first Sydney rock oyster and it was yeah. kind of surprising. Surpri Look, surprisingly, we don't have, a, ex the rock oysters aren't exported a lot. I think, okay. you know, one of the, one of the, one of the stumbling points, <coughs> excuse me, one of the stumbling points, I suppose, is the fact that it has a very unique flavor profile. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, there's, you know, a lot of, seafood producers here in Australia view Southeast Asia and East Asia as this big black hole of opportunity. Um, but the rock oyster and, and farmers in the past have tried to go to China with the rock oyster and, and found it's a bit like trying to sell red wine to the average Chinese consumer 30 years ago, yeah. um, where they'd have to mix it with Coke or Fanta to make it palatable to their palate. Um, and I look, I, I'm, it is such a really unique flavor profile that you know that's why it's not a, just an easy sell mm -hmm. to to the uninitiated uh so like whilst yeah there are some good operators <laughs> i'm sure that when you ate it in jakarta it was probably in, in an international hotel where there may well have been an australian expat chef working yeah. um because you know to sell it off the bat to the uninitiated it, it's you know it's it's going to take a lot of effort to to get it recognized um but but as the world opens up to exploring oysters with different flavor profiles different texture profiles then the sydney rock will certainly shine yeah fantastic oh, yeah i wish we could maybe you can take him through new zealand and <laughs> I'll have another one for you. <laughs> oh so unfair okay yeah. well so i think we're we're basically at uh a, a little bit over time but this is freaking really interesting i've had no idea like there's so much nuance in history and culture of the Sydney rocks. I really want to try them now. Um, well, head, head out to the Appalachian Oyster website. That's, there's yeah. plenty of great information there. And as I said, look, we've got this amazing book. Oh, yeah. I'm happy to uh, send a couple of those off to a couple of your people there. Thank um, you. Yes, that's going to be awesome. Sure. Wait, and I'll can tell you, you what, I also, I also you send you one in? of these. Wait, what's I'll that? One of those. That's, that's the book that I wrote, which is the Australian Fish and Seafood Cookbook. Oh, awesome. So. Yeah. I didn't know you uh, wrote a book, John. <laughs> I'll send you both, Julie. <laughs> that is awesome. Well, yeah. you know, of course, now everybody is being shy and we don't have any questions, but I do have a last one for yeah. you, which is if you could visit anywhere else in the world to try their local oysters, where would you like to go? You know where I want to go? I want to go to Washington State and I want to, I want to try Kumamoto's in Washington State. I've tried them in Kyushu in japan yeah and i'm fascinated about i mean i've eaten the i've eaten the the uh washington state kumamoto's in oyster bars in la or new york but i want to go to washington state and see how they farm there and eat them on the water because i just think that it's such a unique fish that uh and it has such a unique flavor profile that i just i want to eat it on the water yeah it's it's more like you're eating it from the mud because they literally are just <laughs> kind yeah. of just broadcasted in the in the ground, but I I agree. Like Washington Kumamoto's, specifically, I really like Taylor Shellfish's Kumamoto. Okay, yeah, they're the best. I actually noticed like the picture that um, you sent me. Uh, this one, hang on, can I add this? The bottom shell actually reminds me a lot of a Kumamoto. 
Okay. They're, right, with the, with the you ridge. know, I don't know yeah. what size they are, but like the little, you know, the ridged cat's paw is very. Yeah, yeah. It's, it just reminds me of one, and and just the overall shape. So. Okay. I don't cool. know, but no, no, um, miner like high minerality in a Kumamoto. Yeah, no, <laughs> like the, we have we have intense minerality. In fact, there's a really good little section in the Appalachian website that go takes the reader through the sort of five pit stops of flavour, uh -huh. and. Whilst they, I think they could be applied to a range of other oysters, they are really specific to the Sydney rock oyster. So get amongst it and get down here and eat rock oysters. Yes. Cool. Yeah. And finally, one more thing is, do you have a favorite pairing with rock oysters? Look, that's a really, I think it's a really tricky question. I mean, we have a, uh, an endemic grape variety here, which is a semion, but it's not a classic French semion. We call it the Hunter River semion. And it is, it's a hybrid that was for, you know, first developed about 180 years ago here in Australia. I think Hunter River Semillon and Rock Oysters are the absolute peaches and cream of matchups. Yeah, it's bloody delicious. Oh, fantastic. Okay, yeah. on my bucket list. <laughs> Come on down, Billy. Thank you so much. So for everybody, please follow Appalachian Oysters on Instagram. And then you can also visit AppalachianOysters.com to learn more about all these amazing farms, different uh, different locations, and it's the fourth one. Oh, my gosh. All right. <laughs> well, thank you again. Have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, and hope you guys, you know, hang in there and probably – yeah, better than New York City, I would say. See you in an oyster bar soon, Julie. Okay, thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye. Okay, so that was John Sussman, who is the owner of Fishtails, a seafood marketing agency, um, like a longtime oyster fan, a head judge of Sydney Royal Show Oyster Competition, and then the founder of Appalachian Oysters, which you definitely should go and check out the website and on Instagram. Um, that was awesome. So I'm still planning in the works a couple more episodes. I know that I've been slowing these down because it's taking me a little more time to, <laughs> to research um, new places to go, but I will be back with some awesome countries. I know I still haven't hit up France, uh, Scotland's on the way, and then I'm still actually trying to cast for Croatia, Argentina, Egypt, if I can get it, Morocco, and then Indonesia. So if you guys happen to know anybody, please, please give me a shout. Until next time, see you later.